This island is such a convenient pit stop for bathroom breaks. It really is. My mom told me that my family's been leaving our phosphate-rich droppings here for millions of years. That's crazy. I mean, imagine how much fertilizer you could make out of this stuff. Hey, look over there. What? 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 This video is sponsored by World of Warships. Nauru is a tiny 8 square mile island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, making it the world's smallest island nation. The origin of the Nauruan people is shrouded in mystery, but if local legend is to be believed, it went something like this. Alright, so you know how the Earth is flat and we gods live on a thin piece of rock pressed up against it? Um, yeah, of course, everyone knows that. Right, so I need you to fly down there and figure out if anything's alive. Yeah, there, there's not a whole lot in the way of intelligent life down here. Just make some, then! Oh yeah, that's right, I'm literally a god! I, I keep forgetting that detail. <laughs> Alright, I'm ready to come up. Hey, spider, I'm ready to come up. Uh-oh. After springing up from rocks or coming over on boats, both are equally plausible, the Naruans quickly populated the island and established a unique culture isolated from the rest of the world. Dividing themselves into 12 clans, the people of Nauru inhabited the thin, low-lying belt of land surrounding the island, only venturing up to the topside to harvest pandanus fruit and cut down trees. Interestingly, even though they literally lived in the middle of the ocean, the Naruans weren't all that interested in sea Faring. The strong equatorial currents made navigation tricky, so why even bother, am I right? Now, naturally, living on an island only slightly larger than the LA airport, you're gonna run into a population problem eventually. Luckily, the people of Nauru had just the solution. Alright people, as you all know, we're gonna run out of space here real quick if people keep making babies. <gasps> what? Okay, come on, people need to stop hooking up. <gasps> When a mommy and daddy love each other very much... <gasps> okay, I see what's going on here. Now that the 1,000 islanders had a stable population, everything would be smooth sailing forever and ever. In 1798, the British whaling ship Hunter stumbled across the island. While it was moored offshore, hundreds of Nauruans took to their canoes and paddled out to inspect the ship. However, the hunter didn't really do anything cool, so the Nauruans soon went back to the island and the hunter left peacefully without establishing any contact. The next Europeans wouldn't arrive until 1830 when Patrick Burke and John Jones, two Irish convicts, escaped a British prison ship and fled to Nauru. The Nauruans welcomed the newcomers and soon there was an established community of European misfits on the island. However, to the surprise of no one, the escaped convicts were a little bit sketchy and John Jones soon established himself as the cutthroat leader of the so-called Beachcombers. In 1837, when five more beachcombers showed up, Jones made them take off all their clothes and then took all their stuff, and in October of 1841 alone, Jones poisoned seven beachcombers, shot four others, and then blamed the Nauruans, who put him on a raft and pushed him out to sea. k k k k k k k k k k k karma By 1845, there were only two Europeans left on Nauru. However, the Europeans in Europe were showing much more interest in the island. Ships would stop by frequently to trade for dried coconut meat, which could then be made into oil, or for advice from elders, which could then be made into crippling anxiety over your worth as a man. In exchange, the Europeans traded the Nauruans guns. Or alcohol. Or both at the same time, mostly both at the same time actually. 
Needless to say, copious amounts of guns and alcohol rarely lead to sunshine and rainbows, so instead of resolving clan disputes in the traditional fashion, people just started getting drunk and shooting each other like real men. By the time that Germany decided Nauru belonged to the glorious Kaiserreich in 1888, the drunken feuds had escalated into a full-blown civil war that had killed over one-third of the island's population. When the Germans declared all firearms illegal on October 2nd, they confiscated 791 rifles from the Nauruans. That's almost a gun per person. <laughs> oh, so beautiful. <laughs> Are you crying? No! Now that everyone had stopped killing each other, the Germans brought in missionaries to convert the Nauruans to Christianity. However, they had some other ideas as well. You can't wear that. Um, respect the drip, Gustav. Oh, oh, right, I'll change! Change was coming to Nauru. And it was only ramping up. In 1896, an officer of a cargo ship found a weird-looking rock on the top side of Nauru. Thinking that it was a piece of petrified wood, he brought it back with him to Sydney and used it as a doorstop for his office. Three years later, an officer from the Pacific Phosphate Company was transferred to the same Sydney office. He noticed a strange-looking doorstop and decided to take a sample to analyze. It was made completely of high-quality phosphate. Phosphate is essentially the fossilized remains of bird poop, but it's incredibly mineral-rich and was a key ingredient in fertilizer at the time. Farms around the world relied on phosphate to keep their farms producing, and Nauru was literally made of it. By 1914, phosphate was being exported off the island in fairly high quantities, but the Pacific Phosphate Company was still a little bummed out. They could make so much more money if the Germans were just out of the picture, but what are you gonna do? When World War I broke out in 1914, Nauru was quickly captured by Australian forces, and at the end of the war, the island was placed under the joint jurisdiction of Britain, Australia, and New Zealand. The most environmentally conscious group you could ask- nope, they're strip mining the whole island. In order to mine all the phosphate, the Pacific Phosphate Company had to bring in workers from Europe and China that carried diseases with them that devastated the native population. By the mid 1920s one out of every three infants died, and almost 200 islanders were quarantined for leprosy. Things would only get worse when World War II broke out. In 1940, Nazi pirates raided the island, and in 1942, the Japanese showed up and deported most of the Nauruans to an overcrowded prison camp off-island. They also took all the remaining lepers out to sea and drowned them, so you know, that's fun. By the time the war ended in 1945, about 550, or almost 30% of the Nauruan population had died. But hey, I'm, at least they were back in charge of their island. After returning to their devastated island, the Nauruans began pressuring the British and Australians to leave them alone and let them play with the bird poop for a change. When the British and Australians finally left in 1968, about 33% of the island had been strip mined, but come on, those are rookie numbers. Push them up guys, I want to see triple digits! By 1975, Nauru had amassed a profit of over $2.5 billion from phosphate mining, enough for every citizen to receive a handout of $350,000. With that kind of money, I could buy myself 1.8 million chicken McNuggets. Or you could buy me a house so that I don't have to sleep in that leaky shipping container anymore. Um, Nauru also had a hard time making wise investments. For example, in attempts to diversify their income, Nauru started an airline company that no one wanted to fly on, opened 400 banks that were really just used for money laundering, built numerous hotels that were promptly seized after the whole bank thing failed, and sponsored a disastrous West End musical about Leonardo da Vinci. Now, to be fair, much of this was not the fault of the Nauruans. They relied heavily on foreign financial advisors who were often corrupt, so you could probably see where that would go. However, by the at the start of the 21st century, the phosphate was gone. Nauru was bankrupt, unemployment was at 90%, and 80% of the island was completely uninhabitable. 
Naru needed to find <sighs> alternative ways to make money. All right, I would like to call this meeting to order. First up to speak is Naru. <clears throat> um, yes, Taiwan is part of China. Russia's invasion of Georgia was totally legit. The dress was blue. Still short of cash, in 2001, Nauru offered to let Australia build a detention center for undocumented migrants on their island. The camp ran until 2007 and housed over a thousand detainees at its height before closing. However, Nauru wasn't super happy about losing all that Australian aid the camp brought with it, and politics are a thing, so the camp was reopened in 2012 but closed again in 2019. Looking into the 2020s though, Naru seems to have a bright future ahead of it. Wow, poignant social commentary and a direct transition into today's sponsor. <laughs> You've really outdone yourself this time. World of Warships is a huge free-to-play multiplayer game where you can play as hundreds of different ships from 10 different nations. Before this video came out, I did some... <clears throat> research, and I can confirm that the game is actually really fun, and from my time playing, it wasn't pay to win at all, which is always a concern of mine with these free games. The graphics are also really good as well, and I had a great time just looking at all of the historically accurate ships I was too much of a noob to unlock. However, if you want to play as some of those cool ships without having to explain to your mom that no, you can't pause it, you can use the code BATTLESTATIONS2020 and receive the USS Charles as well as a million credits and 250 doubloons to buy other ships. If you want to download the game and try it for yourself, use the link in the description and who knows, maybe I'll organize a game on Discord sometime so that you can help me overcome my crippling fear of playing games with voice chat. <laughs>